Hello everybody, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology and today we are going to be talking about Mars retrograde. Mars is actually turning retrograde today, it's June 27th and um, that's a pretty significant um, moment astrologically. Mars retrogrades are not the most common occurrence so um, we're going to be talking about what, to, what it means that Mars is turning retrograde, what you can expect from the retrograde of Mars over the course of a long period of time. It's of course the full moon um, as well right now. So you know, the full moon's coming through uh, very shortly. Let's see, I'll give you the exact time. Full moon will be coming through um, uh, late this evening, Eastern time. It'll be earlier evening on the West Coast. Um, but yeah, so it's full moon. And uh, we also have Mars turning retrograde in Aquarius this evening. So two big astrological events at the same time. Of course, we've talked about the full moon a little bit this week already. Um, as I, I've mentioned, both in a written post and in a video blog that I did, um, the opposition of the sun and Saturn that's perfecting right now. So you've got uh, a big full moon that has a sun-Saturn opposition in the mix, while you also have Mars turning retrograde. So I'm not going to spend as much time on the full moon, but a few basic things to say. One is that um, uh, the, with the full moon, uh, there's an intensification of events every month around the full moon. So you, you kind of think of the ebb and flow of life every month, every year, and it, it waxes and wanes. And we get to a full moon, it's, you're reaching a kind of culmination point. And then at this full moon in particular, we have uh, the sun uh, opposing Saturn. When I've talked about this at length, but just a few reminders, the sun is light and ambition and knowledge and clarity, and the sun is uh, that, that sense of having something special to do. Saturn um, is limits, duty, constraint, old age, time, wisdom. So uh, when the two come together, there can be a feeling of uh, a great work that's being undertaken uh, with a, in order to accomplish something, there's a great contractive um, period that, that uh, surrounds the Sun-Saturn opposition and you, you're trying to accomplish something and there's a, a feeling of exerting a lot of energy and effort in, in order to do so. On the other hand, the Sun-Saturn opposition can be heavy. You can feel like your light, your ambition, your sense of self is being blocked, is being criticized, is being um, uh, prohibited somehow. There can be the feeling of negation or depression in the air, of lethargy. Um, we've said in the past couple of uh, um, things that I've posted, I've mentioned that sometimes we don't leave enough room for depression and heavy things in spiritual life. And that causes a lot of people to quit before they get started or to abandon projects, uh, whether that's a, a creative project or your, you know, your, your spiritual life, because we feel like it's too heavy, it's too difficult. So that full moon opposite Saturn right now may be amplifying those themes of heaviness, the burden, the labor, the difficulty. Um, on the other hand, that those very themes are a part of every great work. So the Saturn-Sun opposition is also sort of the magnum opus transit. It, it has that feeling of a great labor, um, but one that may result in something truly masterful or something really accomplished. Um, for me, today and tomorrow, I'm finishing um, over 200 Uranus and Taurus reports that I've been working on every day for like, I don't know, 40 days or something. So it's been, you know, it's just been a, a long labor intensive process. And I can feel it. It's very Sun Saturn. Like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. You know what I mean? I'm getting to the end. The finish line is in sight. So I want to finish this and get on to new work. Um, and, and that, you know, um, that was uh, something that I noticed it started the feeling of feeling weighed down by this started just as soon as the sun entered cancer because then it started sun started applying to the opposition of saturn right away so at any rate you may be feeling those things at this full moon time it's normal you can also see issues surrounding authority figures men the paternal tradition structure um, and a sort of prohibitive feeling around those things. Issues with fathers or grandfathers can become acute. Um, sometimes fathers or grandfathers pass away during this time. Saturn is a planet that's associated with um, death and, uh, you know, um, mortality. And the sun is, of course, related to the paternal. So those images can be kind of, uh, they can come together and sometimes, you know, gr grandpa passes away or something like that. Um, other times you'll see um, with Sun opposite Saturn, you can also see themes of um, 
this feeling of needing to uh, sweat something out uh, to the pressure is is building. And and um, and sometimes there's a feeling too of being martial or, or not martial, being um, uh, really regimented and overly strict or austere about things. You know, kind of um, tunnel tunnel vision at at best. You know, can it can help you get something done. At worst, it can um, be very exclusive and it can um, be exhausting for others and um, for yourself. So again, just a. a a list, short list of things to think about as this full moon comes through. If you're interested in learning more about the full moon, read the Sun Saturn opposition post that I wrote uh, just a few days ago on my Facebook wall. You can just find that at Adam Ellenboss on Facebook. Um, otherwise, um, check out the video that I did about Sun opposite Saturn, and you'll have between those two things, you have plenty to get into with regard to today's full moon. <clears throat> but we really want to talk about today, I've called this talk Mars Retrograde, Laying Down Our Swords. What we really want to talk about is the summer, one of the main events of summer, in addition to a bunch of big eclipses that we have. We have Mars Retrograde all summer. Starting today, uh, it'll turn retrograde. Uh, let's see, I'll just give you, see if I can give you the exact time. Uh, so it's stationing, it's stationed right now, which means that the planet is basically not moving uh, from our perspective, and uh, around five o'clock, five between five and six, it uh, turns retrograde Eastern time today. So that's you know early afternoon if you're on the West Coast. Um, so we want to talk about Mars retrograde from a variety of perspectives. Mars is going to be retrograde in Aquarius all through the summer. It's got a major uh, lunar eclipse. It's conjoined with late July, July twenty seventh. And then um, it'll finish its retrograde in late Capricorn, um, and that's going to be toward the very end of August. So, you know, you've got two solid months, basically, of Mars being retrograde. We want to figure out what that means, what to expect, how to navigate the, the transit the best we can. Whenever I say how to navigate the transit, um, I should say that I don't mean that the transit has... Um, you know, transits are basically like symbols of um, the way that the the modes of material nature uh, are flowing. And they also stand in to represent uh, uh, the, the karma and the um, destiny paths that we're living. So you can always, I, I've said this a bunch before, but you can always think of a transit in two ways. One is uh, the transit represents a, a kind of environmental influence the planet itself is not, I don't personally think of the planet itself as causing that influence. I just think of it as indicative of a kind of influence that's moving in nature right now, like the Tao. Um, uh, the Tao is very similarly, the Tao is a kind of, uh, you, you learn to study the Tao, what you're really learning to study is a sort of subtle elemental plane of reality where forces are moving around and you're trying to align yourself or tune yourself with them. So we always study a transit on the, on, on the level of seeing it as a representation of the forces of nature and how they're moving in you and around you and how to attune yourself to them the best way that you can. Um, so that's one thing that we're going to talk about and we can talk about in most astrological transits is that very idea. On the other hand, um, Mars retrograde, like any transit, will also signify things that are going to happen because they're destined to happen that you can't change because it's part of your curriculum in this life. It's part of what you're here to experience. It's a part of why you incarnated in this particular body, in this particular moment in history with a particular family that you have and all of the circumstances of your life because there are certain things that you're here to experience. That's just a very basic astrological idea. A lot of astrologers take up that idea in different ways. But so we want to understand this transit for the sake of understanding what might happen to us in terms of circumstances in life that are fated or destined. We also want to understand this transit in terms of the forces of material nature, the flow of the Tao, so to speak, and how we might align ourselves with it the most, you know, with the most intelligence. So um, first of all, let's talk about a retrograde planet. I've mentioned this in previous talks before, but let's talk about it. Um, very, very basically, all planets are carried along through the sky by primary motion. Uh, primary motion has been talked about by philosophers and astrologers dating all the way back to Plato. Um, primary motion of the sky is what brings the sun, for example, 
uh, from rising in the east to culminating up above to then setting in the west. And then it comes, goes sort of on the other side of the earth, follows the same pattern, then eventually, and that's our nighttime, and then it eventually rises again. Similarly, all the stars along the ecliptic, the zodiac, and um, all of the planets moving along the zodiac uh, follow the same basic, uh, they're carried by the same basic motion. They all rise in the east, they culminate above, and they set in the west. And this is caused, of course, by the rotation of the earth on its axis. So this goes round and round and round like this uh, ceaselessly. It's the fastest motion in the sky. No single planet can move faster than that motion. No planet can overtake that motion. And it was long ago by Plato associated with um, the divine realm because it's a, it's a singular, circular, continuous motion that unifies and is the sort of uniting astronomical factor for all the planets, all the stars, the sun included. So... Um, uh, first of all, all planets are being carried by this primary motion. Um, on the other hand, all planets also have something called secondary motion. Secondary motion reflects the fact that each planet has its own individual speed, its own individual uh, variability. Uh, when it gets very luminous and bright, when it tends to get dim, when it rises in the east, when it sets, when it rises in the in in the west, um, evening star, morning star. Every planet also uh, has its own speed through the zodiac. Jupiter is much slower than Mercury. Um, every planet has its own inherent kind of character as well. So the planets themselves and their secondary motions move the opposite direction through the sky. They're moving through the zodiac against the backdrop of the stars, moving around the sun out in space. And that takes them through the zodiac from our perspective. And that movement through the zodiac moves against the grain of the primary motion, which means that even though uh, the sun, for example, is being carried from the east to high noon to setting in the west every day, it's also very gradually one degree at a time moving through the 360 degree circle of the zodiac going in the opposite direction, which means it's going through, you know, from right now it's going through Cancer toward Leo. And it's going from Leo uh, toward Virgo, like that, through the zodiac. And that motion takes it from west toward the east in the sky from our perspective. It seems to move against the grain of the primary motion. Well, the idea of two contrary motions moving at the same time, simultaneous to one another, interconnected yet different, that is the basic uh, principle of a lot of mystical thinking and the entire system of the I Ching is built on similar logic. So you have two motions in the sky that are interjoined, that are kind of connected with one another, you're yoked together. Um, the astronomy of the sky symbolically is helping illuminate a metaphysical paradigm that ancient astrologers had. They expressed it in many different ways through many different schools of philosophy and thought, but the, the sky is reflecting a, basic, a, a, a very basic paradigm the basic paradigm, according to Plato, was that the primary motion of the sky reflects something of eternity, meaning that circle that carries everything, fastest motion, round and round and round, is reflecting the eternal. The eternal is changeless in some sense, perfect, ideal, like a perfect mathematical circle as opposed to one you might draw, or the circles that you see in nature. There's many different instances of them, but they all come and go. But the perfect circle, in a more abstract sense, exists somehow eternally. Similarly, uh, in many traditions, including the yogic tradition, um, you have an eternal soul. Y you know, your eternal soul uh, is never born, never dying, uh, unborn, undying. Uh, it, and yet it comes and goes through many forms in the material world. It takes on this body and then it takes on that body. It takes on the body of a child and then a, a young person and then a middle-aged person and then an old person and then it dies and the idea is that it goes like this. So the uh, from whether you're uh, looking at Platonism or Neoplatonism or if you're looking at yogic philosophy in the East, the same basic idea applies everywhere and we see it repeated in the symbolism of the sky. The sky demonstrates eternality in that round and round and round motion carrying everything seamlessly. It's the sort of unity that uh, points towards something 
uh, that is constant beyond the world of material changes. But of course, the planets and their secondary motions moving through the zodiac all represent the fluxional changes of the material world. So the planets and their idiosyncratic speeds and different cycles, different synodic cycles with the sun, they are all representative of the world of coming to be and passing away, of impermanence, of things that change, of uh, the fact that uh, I could draw a circle in the sand and it's a representation of some ideal perfect mathematical circle, but the waves will come and wash it away. And then I have to draw another one. Or that, you know, my body will come into being and pass away, but my soul will remain. So the planets in their secondary, their basic property of the planets um, in their secondary motions, moving against the grain of the zodiac, uh, is related to their direct motion in the zodiac. So when a planet is moving direct through the zodiac, like Mars is moving through Aquarius right now, and it is on its way toward Pisces, um, that would be reflective of the, the, the realm uh, that we all live in. Mars is, for example, Mars is related to your will, your uh, desires, your actions. Okay, so in the world, um, very basically, when I'm in my eternal spirit soul is in this form called Adam, I might want a brownie, or I might want to go jogging, or I might want to go talk to a friend. I have some desire to do something, and so then I act on that desire, and I go and take actions in the world. And that's, in a sense, um, that's... Um, this world is filled with a constant fluctuation of of actions and reactions like that. Co actions that we take and then consequences that they have, chain reactions that they have, and they keep moving around and around and around like that. And yet every action in the material world is thought to be um, a sort of temporary re reflection of something eternal or archetypal, something unchanging, the perfect circle that exists beyond. So if you get that philosophy down, you're in a great position to start understanding what retrogrades mean. Um, because for ancient astrologers, for Indian astrologers, for example, the planets were called grahas. Grahas means grabbers. Um, uh, the eternal spirit soul in this world is thought to be occupying something like a, an AI suit. It uh, has come to the material world to have a, a particular kind of experience in a particular body at a particular moment in history, et cetera, et cetera, because of uh, a deep uh, uh, sense of uh, desire, uh, uh, desires that propel us to be here in particular forms and to take particular series of actions and reactions to experience them and see what they're like, right? So, um, but they, they were called, the planets were called grahas or grabbers specifically because after a certain point in time, it's thought that the spirit soul basically starts looking at all of the different actions and reactions in the material world and being like, you know, none of these are really making me that happy. They all sort of just cycle endlessly in stages of uh, one thing happening and then another thing happening and nothing really lasts. <clears throat> Things, once I get them, are very sometimes difficult to maintain. Everything here is very fleeting, right? It's like Heraclitus said, you can't step in the same river twice. <clears throat> so eventually you start realizing, hey, you know, I'm, what I'm looking for in all of these actions that I'm taking in the world, um, I, what I'm really looking for is something that's going to make me eternally happy. Uh, the basic idea of why we take a lot of actions in the world is that we're looking for love. We're looking for happiness. So we go around and we look for it. And we take all of these actions. We go through all these lifetimes. We do all these things. And we're looking for happiness. But the idea that ancient astrologers had about the planets, especially in India, is that um, the planets as symbols represent the forces of material nature that we are unconsciously grabbed by that take us along and say, you know what will really make you happy? It's that pan of brownies. You know what's really going to make you happy? It's like, uh, you know, getting really cut at the gym. You know what's going to make you really happy? It's having a big bank account or, or whatever. All the things we do, you know what's going to make you really happy? It's going to be, you know, being, um, being a PhD or whatever, you know, having a PhD or whatever. These are the things that will give you power, status, happiness, whatever. And as long as that's how we're operating, as long as that's how we're moving through the world, then the thought is that we're just caught up in the river of uh, fluxional material forces that are just dragging us somewhat unconsciously through one cyclical material experience after another. And then at some point we say, you know what, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I want to find a way of aligning my consciousness with the divine. 
and with uh, with some higher will or purpose for my life. Maybe uh, I want to start um, looking for a way of um, separating my doing doing some healthy differentiation, getting some healthy distance or separation from the forces of nature that tend to drag me from one thing to the next, grabbing my consciousness and just dragging me along. This is all very important for Mars. This is where we're going with this. And so you say, oh, I want to use my free will differently. I want to become more conscious of the forces and influences that are pulling me along. And that's when, you know, uh, astrology can be very, very helpful in this regard because astrology is basically a map of the different kinds of uh, forces and the different kinds of uh, karmas in your life that tend to drag you around. So we get some understanding, some awareness of what those forces are. We have the chance to separate or do some healthy differentiation from them. So that's one of the main reasons that that's the main thing that astrology can help us map out. Becoming more conscious of those forces, uh, we don't have to be dragged along by them. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, um, uh, it's, it's important to understand all of that in the context of talking about retrogrades. Because when you're talking about a retrograde, the, the normal MO of a planet representing a force in material reality that you are being pulled along by, either as a part of your destiny or as an influence that is taking your free will and grabbing it. Um, the normal motion of a planet moving direct through the zodiac, its secondary motion, that's the graha, that's the grabber. That's the thing that has the chance to pull you along rather unconsciously or that a- act as the force of your destiny, Okay. When a planet turns retrograde, what's happening? It's starting to move backward. Well, if a planet in its secondary motion starts to move backward, that means it's falling back into the primary motion. Its motion is now going with the larger flow of the primary motion rather than moving against the grain of it with its own willful, uh, its own sort of willful intentions. So one of the main ways to understand retrogrades is in terms of a, a, a a planet as a symbol representing some aspect of desire or aversion in our life, which propels all of our actions. So whatever you want or whatever you don't want, that's at a very basic level propelling the actions you take. When a planet falls back into the primary motion, it's as though the um, the desires and aversions that you have, that are, especially those that are more unconscious, that act on you in in ways that are very strong that you can't control, um, the will, the desire, or the aversion can become easily thwarted. So for example, um, let's say with Mars, which represents will, when Mars starts falling back into the primary motion, it very basically represents the frustration of the will. Why? Because Mars is like the planet of the will. And when it's moving forward through the zodiac, in a sense, and it represents the, just the forward march of the, um, uh, of the will, just moving along, uh, influenced by whatever modes of nature that it's being influenced by to take actions in a particular way. And um, generally speaking, uh, retrogrades can put us in, in, in touch with our will in a really profound way with Mars retrograde, because we get to see what happens when the forward march of the will is frustrated. And when it falls back into the greater primary motion of the sky, it's also as though it has the potential to start aligning itself better with the Tao. Rather than going against the grain of the primary motion, it has the ability to be understood as something that can be put into service of a higher law or of a higher, uh, a higher intelligence. So the, and that, that goes for any retrograde planet. That's why, for example, during Mercury retrogrades, you have snafus with um, communication or technology meltdowns or problems while traveling. That's because if we're just moving forward through life all the time, right? What, you know, and then all of a sudden, your, you know, the grid or the matrix starts glitching because Mercury has started falling back into the primary motion. And when that happens, all different kinds of wiring that's normally about forward momentum, that's its own like willful direction, gets, it gets frustrated. It gets sort of stifled. And when that happens, communication meltdowns happen, you know, uh, delays happen, all this kind of stuff. The point is not just that the planet doesn't stop, that the planet has stopped working. Uh, the greater point is that 
when the planet stops working, we have an opportunity to see the fact that there is, in, there is indeed some force that's working on us. So there's all sorts of lessons that come up under retrogrades that have to do with relinquishing control, uh, becoming more conscious of unconscious forces. That's a very basic way of thinking about retrogrades. Um, <clears throat> a retrograde can, can also mean that destiny is taking over. Whereas the planet normally represents a kind of the forward march of our own will and desire and uh, the, the influence just taking us, you know, in its own way to when it falls back retrograde into the primary motion, it's as though a larger force has taken the wheel. Things, we, we lose control. And uh, again, that can be really educational. So you have frustration of will or you have a larger force taking over. Either way, those are two really strong signatures to take into consideration when looking at any kind of retrograde. Um, so uh, the other thing that you can always think about with retrogrades are that something that has been gained, like Mars is a hunter. So Mars goes out and does things and gets things and desires things and takes things for itself. And then when Mars falls backward, it is literally going back through the degrees that it had previously sort of consumed in forward motion. So when the planet is going backward through the zodiac, it's giving up that which was previously gained. And I use the example sometimes of Pac-Man, like eating up the little goblets of degrees in the zodiac, and then when it moves backward, sort of having to barf them back out, <laughs> you know? So there's something that's been gained that has to be given back. Now, um, the other thing is that it can be reversals, reversals of fortune or reversals of fate um, can happen under retrogrades where something was going in one direction and suddenly it's going in the opposite direction. You got so forward momentum and a reversal, uh, giving back that which was gained, frustration of the normal planetary force, which is usually equated with will. Um, uh, and Mars is like the quintessential planet of will, but every planet in the secondary motion in general, the, the secondary motion of the sky tells us that all planets have their own force and their own, they impress their own force upon us as part of the flux and flow of nature. So when they start moving backward, again, frustration of those forces, uh, but also potentially being able to align those forces with uh, a higher intelligence. The soul itself, uh, the, the consciousness that we are often needs retrogrades in order to get a handle on stuff that's just been dragging us along. That's the main point we're trying to make today. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, that's like a sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, Lisa, I like to think it's a, a holistic explanation of retrogrades rather than just saying that something will get, you'll get, you know, retrograde, someone from your past will come back or you you know, something will be ineffective or it'll break down or not work. Yeah. That's a mundane level of explanation. We're taking the underlying principle and applying it and saying, yeah, you know, you might feel ineffective or somewhat powerless during a Mars retrograde, or you might feel more intensely frustrated by things, agitated yet in, in a, unable to do anything or affect the kind of results you'd like to see. But why? Why? If we don't know why, we're not doing astrology. We're just memorizing stuff. So we have to understand the whole point of giving this explanation is not to be tedious, right? It's just because if we don't have some understanding of the primary and secondary motion, the philosophy behind those motions, then we have no real understanding of what it means that a planet is actually moving, falling back, and what that means to us spiritually. So hopefully everyone has some impression of that now. All right. Um, so to resummarize, um, a planet fall has its own secondary motion, which is representative of the world of karmic material forces that the eternal spirit soul is here to experience, but they tend to drag us around unconsciously uh, through our fears and our desires. All the planets have a will of their own and they represent a force that tends to grab us, graha planet, that moves us through life in certain ways that are often deeply unconscious. And so when a planet turns retrograde, falling back into the primary motion, that will is frustrated, which allows us to have greater understanding of the forces dragging us around. Okay. Now, um, and potentially align ourselves with a higher intelligence. So uh, 
what does it mean when Mars turns retrograde? Well, what does Mars represent? Mars is a god of war. Mars is related to uh, the will and to aggression. And uh, Mars is uh, related to cutting and severing things. Mars is related to surgery. Mars is related to like analytical chemistry or math in the sense that you are trying to split the atom or that you are trying to penetrate into the laws of, of nature, the underlying laws of nature. That's all Mars stuff. Alchemy was related to Mars. Cooking is related to Mars and chemistry. Um, but also, you know, more brute things like hunting and sports and desire and machismo and belligerence and the need to win or dominate or conquer. So what I wanted to do today was talk about um, uh, when Mars turns retrograde, um, there, are, there is an amazing opportunity for us because Mars is the quintessential planet of will. And so there's a, an amazing opportunity for us to sort of um, learn some of the deeper uh, lessons about will and about uh, force and about action in life. So here's some of the things that we're going to talk about. First of all, I called this talk laying down our swords for a reason. Um, when Mars turns retrograde, first and foremost, um, there is an opportunity for us to surrender a, a level of willfulness in our life. We, we are all willful. There's not one of, I don't know one person I've ever met who isn't willful. So, you know, sometimes in astrology, we're like, oh, you're, you know, you're a, you're a Scorpio, you're a fixed sign. So you're really willful. You know, as if only some signs are will, as only, only some signs are willful. You know, I don't know one sign that isn't willful because being willful is about being human. It's not about the zodiac. It, it, it's prior to the invention of the zodiac, people were being willful. You know what I mean? So everybody's willful. Everybody has something that they're willful about, whether it's a great noble cause or whether it's just you know the desire to make a lot of money. People act every day based on a set of desires and intentions and everyone has a strong will. Um, <clears throat> the will, even when it is being lazy, is still being willful because it's being willfully ignorant or willfully uh, in denial of something that it needs to be doing, namely something that's healthier. The will when it is uh, out in the world doing things that it knows it shouldn't be is being both willful in order to accomplish those goals and willfully ignorant about what it should be doing, you know? So the will is, is at work in lots of different ways in our life all of the time. Um, when Mars turns retrograde, you, one thing to think about is think about, uh, you know, a, a strong swimmer, a, a, a really like Michael Phelps or something, and he's swimming against the current of a mighty river, like maybe the Mississippi, and he's swimming upstream against the current. And then all of a sudden he reaches a place where suddenly he gets a little tired and he has to let go. And then he just floats on his back and it carries him downstream. There's an opportunity for us to do that right now in our, in our lives to, um, on some level, to surrender. So that's the most basic thing that I want to say is over the next couple of summer, of next couple of summer months here, see where you can surrender your will. Where are you trying too hard? Uh, where are you, you know, keep pressing the, the gas pedal all the way down and not slowing up uh, where you're not taking time to integrate or taking time to listen or taking time to uh, let others uh, voice be heard or you're not taking time to be uh, uh, the loser or the failure. You know, something that we're all actually starved for is uh, failure and weakness. Um, Here's the main reason that we're starved for failure and weakness. Um, most of us, including myself, have a very hard time imagining that failure or weakness could ever be beneficial to us. What would the point in that be? Well, um, there's a few reasons that failure and weakness may actually be really, really nourishing, um, important things for our spiritual life. Uh, one reason is that um, when we fail... And when we are weak, it is usually precisely in that moment that we are able to recognize the greater forces around us that are strong, that are stronger than us, that exist outside of our will. So when we are the classic, you know, saying that I grew up with in the, in the Christian churches, you know, when, when we're weak, that's when we're able to recognize that God is really strong. That, you know, there's a famous story in the, in the you know, kind of 
parable that's told in the Christian uh, church camps and youth groups that I grew up in. And one of the parables was that you're walking along the beach and uh, you, you see, you're looking at uh, footprints walking along the beach in the sand and you see these, uh, s- you know, single set of uh, footprints for a long period of time. And you're saying, you know, I thought I was living my life walking with God and yet it looks like I'm just walking alone. And then there's this moment in the parable where God sort of responds and says, no, those are the times that I was carrying you. So simple, sort of sweet teaching. But um, when we fail, when we allow ourselves to fail, when we allow ourselves to be weak, it's precisely at that time that we can recognize the greater um, forces of the universe that are carrying us, that have our back. We can recognize the strength of people around us to support us, to help us. When we're weak, it allows others to be strong. And we have to imagine a reality where other people being strong gives us just as much as us being strong. Where asking for help is just as important as um, being the helper, being the one who's got it all together, being the one who's on top of things, being the one to volunteer the answer, to be the expert, whatever. So it's a vulnerable place for us to be in um, because uh, being weak or being uh, tired or being uh, even failing, uh, we, we want to deny that at all costs. But this summer we have an opportunity to, um, to find the victory in defeat, to find the esteem in failure, to find the help that we need that can only come when we give up. So remember those things. And remember also that the frustration of the will is also the beginning of the education of the will. The other thing that's amazing to note, the I Ching tells us this, Taoism tells us this, um, all over sacred texts, uh, replete throughout the I Ching, is this idea that you're you're not, uh, the appropriate use of the will is in how it aligns itself with um, forces that are larger than itself. Uh, forces that are stronger than itself? How does it um, flow along with the forces of nature? So again, it's a perfect opportunity over the summer to become more intelligent about how you use the will, for the will to be educated and to take, to, for the for our willfulness to just check itself and say, ah, you know, before I just assert that thing out there, I'm going to stop and I'm going to listen and I'm going to try to hear and, and feel into the Tao, into the, into the flow of the forces around me. And um, so for a very some simple examples, let's say that you are, um, you're like, I'm just going to, I just am going to go do this thing right now. You're just really impulsively, just up out of your seat and you're going to go do that thing. You may notice during Mars retrograde that you catch yourself before you actually go and do the thing. That's a very, very important moment. It's like, uh, how many of you, you, probably some of you have ever had the moment where you're like, you know, I need to remember something. So, I, and I'm going to forget it unless I make a note of it right now. So you write yourself an email on your phone and you send it to yourself or you write something down and you stick it in a place where you absolutely, you will see it. We don't know, we, we don't always, we're not always aware of the fact that during a Mars retrograde, the universe will be slamming post-it notes all over your psychic space being like stop remember think listen reflect before acting before before willing step back a second listen to that voice all summer before you just mindlessly assert something because the other thing that can happen is that you in a sense you have a mars that's uh potentially getting dragged along by the primary motion means that Mars may, you may have some really intense lessons to learn around Mars. So when Mars is really aggressive and assertive and trying to like do things, but it's not listening, it's, it's being too impulsive. It's being reckless. The consequences can be more severe during a retrograde because your, your will has the potential to be educated. I, I like to think of retrogrades as little divine intervention moments with us. So, um, it, you know, uh, just consider that the universe is trying to give you post-it notes all summer long saying, slow it down, think before you act, harness the impulse, see a different way of applying your will, a different way of approaching what you're going to do. A lot of the times um, we confuse whim for will. This is a big part of Mars retrogrades as well. In the modern era of astrology, especially one of the things that we're really big on is free will. 
uh, we we believe that you know the chart is uh, we tend to think of the chart as a, as a set of possibilities a set of uh, parameters and you're sort of like you're sort of the x-wing pilot you know fighter and and you you're kind of navigating your chart however you want but the problem is that uh, with this paradigm one of the problems anyway is that um, we then start thinking about uh, the use of our free will um, in, uh, in our in our chart as something that we're directing still toward a set of desires that we have that we're never stopping to question. So we say, well, you know, if I really get to do, if I can really do my chart consciously, then I'll get a good marriage and I'll get a good spiritual job and I'll have like, uh, you know, a more a, a more stocked bank account. And but it'll all be done because I've become more spiritual. So this kind of uh, level of um, the use of free will is still being informed potentially by a set of just as unexamined, uh, uh, just uh, a set a set of unexplored um, desires. And so, uh, the one of the big important things of a Mars retrograde is what's the difference between whim and will? Whim does it, and there's very there's very little deep introspection, time to think patient processing or consideration of what you want and why you want it and whether that's healthy or not. There's very little planning. There's very little thinking about the most constructive way of using your will or time or energy toward goals that will give you lasting or abiding happiness in life. And instead, there's just action, action, action from one thing to the next rather mindlessly. And usually the the results are that we, we may get something that we want, we may will our way toward a result, but it doesn't last very long. It doesn't make us as happy as we think it will or we think it is supposed to. And ultimately, that frustrates us. And over time, things that frustrate us again and again and again agitate our entire system, and they can create disease and sickness. No small wonder that the joy of Mars in ancient astrology was the sixth house, which is the traditional house of disease. Um, so there's some way in which the constant seeking and striving after things mindlessly one thing after the next actually agitates our entire system. So uh, when, you, when you think about this summer, the other thing you think about is in listening to these post-it notes from the universe is starting to discern the difference between whim and will. Real will, remember, aligns itself with um, the force of the forces of material nature in an intelligent way in a way that is dovetailing these forces along with the goals of spiritual life deep inner inner peace maintaining a a, a grounded centered existence uh, maintaining more peaceful kind compassionate relationships uh, being a steward of uh, a change in the world and doing so in a way that is not coming from self-righteousness or anger or belligerence or reactivity all of those things we can't build unless we learn how to become like, like you know, we, we kind of have to learn how to become like, like peaceful ninjas. And that, that takes a kind of training of the will. Mars retrograde is a perfect time to do that training. So you can think about that too. My phone keeps going off like every two seconds. So I am going to uh, turn this off. Okay. So, um, Lisa has a question over here that I'm seeing. She says, so um, Mars is, is Mars will or whim? Yeah, uh, it's, it's never, it, it's, let's put it this way. Um, Mars is a, Mars is a force in material nature that tends to uh, activate our, 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 our willfulness, the, the, the strong action desire based response in us. It's a force that flows through us. It's not who we are, whether it's whim or will. It's still a force. Um, so it's something that we utilize and we utilize it either for the sake we either dovetail it to the intentions and direction of spiritual life or it tends to drag us along through one unconscious uh, desire trap after another. Um, that's the basic idea. No one's perfect at it, you know, and th if you try to be perfect at anything, you're getting caught up in Mars as the desire to be, you know, the greatest of all time. You're not trying to, we're not, that's not what we're talking about either. We're just talking about the intelligent use of the will energy so that we, actions and intentions and, and all of that are being aligned with um, an actual plan for our life. Now, um, 
uh, one thing that's also important is that Mars doesn't tend, sometimes Mars misses the, the forest for the, the trees. So um, like, for example, I want a pan of brownies is not, um, uh, you're not really thinking in that case, if you're compelled to go and do that in this, in this way, and you're kind of willful about it, like, ah, they're my, it's my life. I'll li- I want my brownies, you know, so you go and eat your brownies or whatever. Like, that's my choice. So you go and you do it, and but you're not thinking about your long-term plan. You're thinking about the five-minute plan. And again, I've said this a bunch, but in our culture right now, a lot of our entire sense of humor in popular media is based around celebrating celebrating that kind of weakness. It's not a, it's not like we, in other words, we, we, we give, we give a little wink and be like, yeah, I, I so don't care about being bad. And it, and that's like the source a very sarcastic source of a lot of our humor. I don't care about being destructive. Like just give me that bottle of wine and, you know, throw me the bag of Doritos. You know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, and we celebrate that kind of self-effacing, um, I'm no good at any of this anyway, so I don't, I don't care. And I'm just going to do what I want. And it's, it's, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It's a, you know, but um, there's real laziness in all of that. And, and um, not that I'm some, you know, perfect being, but um, I recognize in myself that when I'm like that, I'm, I am not exercising will. Will is exercising me. It, you know, it's, I'm being dominated by something. There's not a lot of reflection and choice because if I'm really reflecting and I say to myself, you know, at some point, uh, five months from now, if I keep living this way, I'm going to look in the mirror and feel not so good about who I am and what I'm doing. You know, so how do I want to act now that's a part of my five month plan? It's a totally different, if I'm thinking in that way, I'm using my intelligence, I'm going to use the surge of will that I feel in a different way. We feel willful at different times of the day, all day long. I'm going to do this. I feel like I should do this. One force is taking me in one direction and then it takes me in another direction and on and on and on. When we bring our intelligence to bear on the situation, then those, those same flushes of Mars energy that come and go throughout our lives, um, those, those impulses can be directed toward a larger vision for what we're here to do. Some people, um, I think way too easily, we look at people who have a plan and we say, oh, they're control freaks. Oh, they're type A. Oh, they're, you know, they're, they're like, uh, they're perfectionists or whatever. You know, let them be perfectionists. I'm nowhere near that organ, that, that organized. Just give me the bottle of wine. And I'm, I'm just, you know, using this kind of as a, a stereotype, but um, that kind of consensus dismissal of having a healthy plan for your life and of being more consciously aware of how you use your time and energy is, is appalling because it's not, you're not a, an anal retentive control freak just because you're thinking of a more constructive way to use your energy every day than getting caught up in whim, right? You're, you know... Uh, so that's just something to think about over the summer months with Mars retrograde. Um, so thinking about the forest from the trees, how can your will be used for a longer plan? Are you using your time constructively? Another thing that happens is we get so exhausted by the, uh, rat race and, and hamster wheel of our desires taking us from one thing to the next unintelligently that we're exhausted and so then we don't make plans. We just say, well, and, and then we, we, of course, we become really attracted to things like living in the moment. But I'm amazed to see um, uh, through social media um, how many people consider uh, a, a liberated lifestyle, spiritually speaking, and presence, spiritually speaking, to be equated with doing whatever I damn well please. Like in, in the mo- I'm in the moment, so I'm just doing what I want. And that's sort of conflated with like a roomy quote and and that's that's the new definition of being present no like that's that's horrible so okay not to really like really judgmental or anything but the point is that when we have a plan for our life we wake up every day for example and we have some sense of how and why we're using our energy at least broadly speaking so that that way we're not setting ourselves up to just get lost in whim in the forest of of whim. Uh, one of the things in, in Buddhism, that's uh, the word nirvana means getting out of the forest, the, the forest of uh, material desires that we can get so easily lost in. And the word nirvana means to cease 
or, or um, get out of the, all of the constant fluctuations and changes in, that are contained in a sort of vast forest. So at any rate, um, you know, if we just approach our day with no plan, with no sense of where our actions should be leading us, it's very easy to get lost. We open the door for illusion, distraction, laziness, and self-justification to sneak right in. So you can feel in what I'm saying here, there's also a call to action, to using action in the right way, to having a larger plan or vision for our life. That doesn't mean that there's still not creativity, spontaneity, play, uh, uh, unstructured time. It's not like that at all. It's just saying, don't just let yourself be aimlessly dragged from one thing to another, exhausted all the time. So how do, you, how do you respond? It's a lot easier to respond to the forces of nature when you have some sense of what's healthy and what isn't, where your energy should be applied and, and where it shouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> so these are some things to think about. We've gone through just about my entire list, so I'm about um, uh, ready to complete this. Uh, is there a kinder way of doing or saying something? Is there a kinder way of doing or saying something? Another one is, is this conflict or struggle worth my time? Do I really want to get into a large debate on some Facebook post right now? Um, am I expressing myself in a way that is um, building things up even as I'm having to assert something? Um, am I listening as much as I'm asserting? Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, basically the wise sage is someone who sees action in inaction and inaction in action. There's another really amazing thing that we can think about right now, and that is sometimes by doing nothing, we do just the perfect thing to advance everything we're working on in life, just by doing nothing. It's amazing to think that doing nothing can accomplish a lot. That's a great Mars retrograde teaching. On the other hand, um, we can also understand that there is a way of doing anything that is also completely unattached to whatever it is that we're doing. So you see action and inaction and inaction in action. So how I have to go and I have to do a bunch of stuff. I have to make money. I have to pay bills. I have to do all of this. But how can I do it in a way where I'm not just throttling the steering wheel, just like, oh, just how am I not, how would I go through it without gripping down, bearing my teeth and stressing my whole system out? So action uh, it, by doing nothing. And also, when we have things to do that are part of the material world that we have to be in, where actions are necessary, no one escapes action. We all have to take action. We all have to deal with the forces of, of will and desire. How can I move through the things I have to do that are high pace, that require a lot of intensity and focus? How can I do them with a, an inner sense of peace and stillness? So action and inaction and, um, and vice versa. Um, is there a kinder, gentler way of doing or saying something? Um, yeah. Okay. So those are some of the big things to think about here. Last but not least, we have, uh, Mars in Aquarius. Aquarius is a human sign. It's called, sometimes called a humane sign. It's an air sign. So the picture of the water pourer, um, first of all, it's very social. So, uh, whenever you have, you know, a Mars retrograde in an air sign, the potential for the Mars retrograde to play out within social dynamics, within intellectual exchanges, exchanges of ideas, exchanges of, uh, you know, communication, emails, social forums, groups that you belong to. Uh, for Libra, Gemini, or Aquarius, the social dimension of the air signs is very strong. So you want to watch for how this plays out uh, specifically in your social life. That's a very important thing to consider. Uh, with Mars retrograde, um, you know, you especially want to be careful of debacles or unhealthy levels of conflict or uh, power struggle within um, your relationships to people, your social circles, things like that, or within organizations that you belong to where there's a, there are uh, cultural differences to navigate. Um, there are uh, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds that are different in, in large groups that you're a part of, like all sorts of things that can be tipping points for conflict in social dynamics. Just be careful of those all summer. Um, some conflicts are worth having. Some conflicts are absolutely not worth having. Most of the time, even the conflicts that are worth having, we're not having in the right way. We're not doing it with <clears throat> some level of deep 
sensitivity and tactfulness, you know, and, and tact. So that's just something for, we can be inspired to think about how to, if we are going to have a conflict, if something is necessary to, to look at, then if we have to revise a strategy or we have to confront something, how can we do that in a way that's really mindful and thoughtful? And again, considering the idea that sometimes inaction is the, is the best action. Uh, other, other times uh, not, but that's just something to think about. All right. Uh, also, Aquarius is um, the home of Saturn. Now, um, <clears throat> Saturn in both uh, um, Capricorn and Aquarius has different m moods. The Aquarian mood is a little different than the Capricornian mood. I won't go through those distinctions so much today, but what I will say is that Saturn is the dimmest, uh, farthest planet out in our solar system. And so as such, it's kind of the quintessential outsider or gatekeeper between the realm of the visible and the invisible. Saturn holds that place as the dim, distant one. And as such, Saturn is associated with people who are outside the margins, people who are... Uh, um, their light isn't as bright or they're not as seen. And so Saturn, way before Uranus was starting to be associated with Aquarius, um, had a relationship in the sign of Aquarius in particular to socially marginalized or outcast people, people who were different, whether that means they're a virtuoso um, you know, composer or a genius of mathematics or, a, or whether it means that they're a, a beggar. It, it, it means, you know, Saturn and Aquarius is, there's some, uh, first of all, there's some sense with Saturn and the, its rulership of Aquarius of there being people who are outside the city walls, outside the city gates, or that live at the margins or edges of the city. They're living in the streets. They're, they're different somehow. They stand out as different. And sometimes, even if they're very talented, that's not an easy thing to deal with. It's, it's not easy to be in that position. So, and yet the, that position is able to objectively view the city, the life in the valley of, of, of the world um, with a, a contemplative depth, a rational understanding that is sometimes just extraordinary. And so um, Aquarians are, you can think of Aquarians in general as sometimes just people who are, um, have a certain kind of sympathy or understanding of that which is different or marginal or uh, fringy or whatever. It's not, in classical astrology, it has nothing to do with Uranus. It, it has more to do with the melancholic creative state that is associated with people who are dim, distant, at the edges, fringes, or boundaries. Um, deep m melancholy associated with that and, and amazing creativity that's associated with the melancholic temperament in ancient astrology. And then um, we also have uh, the theme of um, people you might, so you may, you may be at the edges in some ways, or you could be a sectarian. You could be something who, someone who believes in something quite strongly and wants everyone else alienated. That's why Aquarius is also associated with dogma. Um, so the, 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 it can not just about that, which is at the fringes and marginalized and in, in, because of some special gift or insight, but also about the desire to marginalize or alienate people that you feel don't fit in. And that's the, the repressiveness and, and strictness and, uh, like that of, of Saturn. So, um, <clears throat> so you can have it go either way. So with Mars in this sign, uh, you also want to think about the cause of the outsider, the, um, the cause of that, which is, you know, the, taking up the cause uh, or the, um, the mission or, or fighting for or on behalf of outsiders or people who are marginalized or different. But you can also think of the sort of um, intense dogmatism. Mars retrograde is a sort of intense level of, of willfully defiant dogmatism. And, 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 and so that may really amp up over the summer a little bit, especially the July 27th eclipse with Mars conjoining the lunar eclipse with the south node of the moon. That's going to be uh, probably pretty intense. Um, but uh, uh, advocating on behalf of things that are marginalized or people or groups that are marginalized or marginalized or fringy ideas in a powerful way, um, in a Mars kind of way, um, or you have sectarian kinds of things in a really Marsy way. Those are some general things about Aquarius. Two things. 
uh, to close. One, challenging thought. The outsider, the prisoner, the outcast, um, to a certain extent, when railing against the status quo is entering into a kind of uh, endless duality with the status quo. And so um, this is like going back to eighth grade, right? In eighth grade, that person who is like, screw the jocks, I'm going to be different. And then every day for the next year of their life, while they're wearing different clothing, are giving the middle finger to the jocks. Uh, there's no um, exploration of why it is that we, uh, that we hate the jocks. And maybe there's some secret envy or longing to be one of them. On the other hand, the exact opposite condition happens too. This I'm just thinking of my own junior high experience. Uh, the jocks or the popular sporty kids would be like, look at those stupid skateboarders or you know, whatever, whatever group they didn't like. Every single day, they would sort of prop themselves up as being so great in contrast to everyone that they didn't like. So the point is that on some level in this world of duality, um, everyone that we, uh, if we make the focus of our energy and time, the wrongness of some other group, even if it's a legitimately uh, despicable uh, group of people or uh, particularly despicable philosophy or ideology or something that we're railing against, anytime that we're against something with Mars, we are in joining ourselves to it at the same time. Um, this is a secret dichotomy between Mars and Venus. We are, uh, we are to, to, to the extent that we are fixated on the wrongness of someone else, even if we're justified in being up, upset with someone, uh, we join ourselves to that. This is like Star Wars when Luke Skywalker, in order to defeat the dark side, has to set down his lightsaber, has to not let anger and rage be the thing that engages him in the battle with the darkness. It's a different way of defeating darkness. That's Mars retrograde in Aquarius. It's a different different strategy. Being anti doesn't really work. It does not mean that you don't have something that you need to fight, a, a real foe, a real enemy that is a real threat. But it means that being anti may not work right now. Uh, Lisa said that very well. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> uh, you know, basically, um, the question is, how do we make an effort to fight against something that we don't want without be taking up a self-righteous anti-position? That's a very good question for the summer. Um, so we'll see those things play out um, and, uh, you know, watch the news and watch the media. One of the things that came up very recently was a politician, I can't remember her name, suggesting taking some approach to uh, uh, Donald Trump that was essentially like uh, going the, I saw the headline, it was just like taking the low road, you know, like let's, let's go for the low road with Trump. And I, I have no idea what this even, was even about. So I, I'm very ignorant about the topic, but that's a perfect kind of headline where then you saw, you saw, I saw Schumer or whatever, Chuck Schumer saying, no, 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 you know, like that's not the way to go. And that's sort of that, you know, but that fact that that stuff is coming up right now as Mars is like, you know, going across the South Node, slowing down, about to go retrograde in Aquarius. It's like, yeah. And how how will we work the will and the, the battle call this summer with this retrograde? Um, what kind of tactics will we use? You may see people reaching the end of the rope, getting really frustrated and trying to resort to strong arming things. And that does not work with Mars retrograde. There's usually pretty intense consequences for that. A lot of backlash that we receive. So we have to be very careful with that. All right. That's what I've got for you guys today. I hope that this was interesting. Um, let's see what, what kind of questions. I'm going to scroll up and see if there's any questions here. I'm happy to have some rest right now. Good time to reevaluate significance of vulnerability. Yeah, but really well said, Jessica. Uh, exploring vulnerability. Sorry, getting too religious here for me. That's okay, Bruce. You're entitled to your own beliefs and opinions. Lisa says, I feel the most alive and present during times of suffering. Yeah, that's a great paradox for Mars retrograde too. Um, a beautiful analogy, knowing that we are being supported always, especially when things are so hard and we do feel so alone. We are never alone. Yes, beautiful. Uh, whim of iron. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, 
some other comments some people sharing personal stories is mars well, we already talked about that one uh mars makes us a bit headstrong um well it, you know uh mars is reflective of a force that we all struggle with and it can express itself as headstrong for sure um it has become vogue to be careless yes that's what i was trying to get at earlier so my imperfect way of trying to demonstrate that but yeah i get the whispers of whimsy talk from the lied piper so i'm always searching for the inner balance and understanding the real work i do in the world yes thank you adam like your videos felt bad doing my best i know it's not enough but i'm i am not told i'm can't really read this very well learning and learning to let go very good um advocating for the marginalized sounds like asteroid lilith wonder what she's <laughs> she's up to uh i don't know i don't i don't spend so much time with um with lilith uh, so to me one thing i'll say about um that paul is that there are a million symbols in astrology you know and some people be get, get to know some of them really really well but we don't need all of them there it's like uh it's like an artist some artists will use 40 tools when they make their art some people will use 10 there's really not um any benefit to using more or less it's really how you use them in astrology these are all symbolic tools so that's what i would say about about that because sometimes people will you may notice the presence of an archetype that very well is speaking to you in in lilith for example um i always like to explain my stance when i say like i don't really work so much with lilith it's nothing against lilith it's just not really in part like my my symbolic focus or toolkit i think the same things can often be said with a fewer symbols that's sort of a part of my personal philosophy and astrology but not that you couldn't use it either Pied, lied Piper. I was supposed to say Pied Piper. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Well, thank you everyone for listening and I hope you have a really great day today. Good luck with this Mars retrograde. We'll be back to talk about it a few more times during the summer, especially with the eclipses. Take care, everybody. Bye.